I will. Uh, I'll just put 20 minutes on the clock, and I'll tell you when to stop. Sorry if I'm rude to just stop you mid sentence, but I'll just let you know when 20 minutes is up, and you can wrap it up, and then uh, and that's it. Okay. Cool. Ready? Yep, we're ready. Okay. Whenever you're ready. Good. Okay, you can start it. All right. Okay. Good afternoon. Thank you for being here. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, we're here today to talk about becoming a double goal coach. The number one goal is coaching for winning, and the number two goal is coaching for life lessons. Before we get started, I'd love to get a sense for how many people here have heard about PCA, are familiar with the organization, or have even attended a workshop. And I'm going to call Positive Coaching Alliance PCA from now on. So how many of you have been to a workshop? Just FYI, I can't see Ruben. Oh, there he is. Okay. <laughs> and how, okay, great. And, and how many of you haven't been to a workshop, but you've heard of PCA? Some of you? Okay. So it looks like we've got a great mix here, um, and that's really helpful to know that as we move forward. For those of you that haven't been to a workshop, what do you think of when you hear positive coaching? And no hurt feelings, cross my heart, I really would love an honest opinion. What do you think of, what's associated in your mind with positive coaching? Good sportsmanship. Good sportsmanship, thank you. What did you say, Rachel? Sunshine and lollipops. Sunshine and lollipops. I hear that a lot. Anything else? Everybody wins. Everybody gets a trophy or a ribbon. Great. I'm really glad you said that, Kelly, because what I hear a lot is positive coaching is associated with participation trophies. And I'm here to tell you that that is not the case. PCA does not believe in participation trophies, sunshine and lollipops for everyone. If you'll see our tagline up here, it's better athletes, better coaching. The operative word here is better. We are comp competitive. We love to win at PCA, and we know that you love to win and that you're competitive. And our goal here today is to talk about how you can do more of that, how you can win more, how you can become more competitive. But we also recognize that sports provides a real unique opportunity to be competitive and to win, but to also teach life lessons. And we want to make sure that you're not missing out on that second really important part of coaching. To further illustrate this, I want to talk a little bit about a personal experience I've had. So, as you heard in my bio, I played lacrosse at the D3 level, but my lacrosse career started in high school when I played in San Diego. Now, in Southern California, 10 to 15 years ago, lacrosse really wasn't a big sport, so I pretty quickly became one of the better players in the area. I was recruited, I moved across country to the East Coast where I played lacrosse um, for Wellesley College, and I quickly realized I was one of the worst players on the East Coast. So now that's a really tough transition, right? And that's going to be tough for anybody, no matter who you are, what sport, what part of the country. If all of a sudden you're in a highly competitive area, that's going to be a tough transition. But what made it harder was that my college coach was not a double goal coach. She was somebody who, she wanted to know, are you guys winners or losers? And if we lost in the scoreboard, we were losers. She was someone that focused a lot of attention on negative feedback. She wanted to criticize us. She didn't want to give us positive feedback and reinforce the things we were doing well. And I think the biggest thing she did, the hardest part for me, was that mistakes were not okay in her mind. So I was so anxious and nervous in practice, trying to play with my left hand, and I'm like this. You, know, you can't relax. You can't play. You can't learn new skills in that way. I was terrified of making mistakes in practice and it was really hindering my ability to get better. I decided to stick with it. I wasn't having fun, but I thought, this is a sport that I love. I want to stick with it. Ended up by junior year seeing the field, and by senior year I was a starter. But I guarantee you that if she was a double goal coach, I would have been better faster, and the team would have won more on the scoreboard. So if I had a time machine, I would take her back, and I would have her sit through this workshop, because I really believe in this, and I know that it would have positively changed the way that she both coached me and the rest of the team. And that's why I'm here tonight. If I can give this back to just a few coaches and a few athletes, then I'll feel really good about my work with PCA. So let's jump right in and talk about PCA principles. Just adjusting the PowerPoint here. Okay. 
There are three PCA principles when we talk about being a double O coach. Elm tree of mastery, filling the emotional tank, and honoring the game. And we're going to talk about all three of those principles today. To start, let's, let's dive into the elm tree of mastery. I'm going to show you, uh, I'm going to show you a, a clip of a football coach from the movie We Are Marshall. And then we're going to talk about his coaching style. Okay, clip from We Are Marshall. That coach is focused on one thing. Did they win or did they lose? And what does it say on the scoreboard? Sure, he mentions effort in the beginning, but he doesn't really care about. He cares about winning the scoreboard. Let's look into that a little further. What do you think the answer is to this question up here? Which Olympians earn more medals? This was an actual study done in, 2000 in the um, Sydney Olympics. Do we think it's, one, those who focus on the scoreboard and winning, or two, those who focus on mastering their sport and getting better? I'd like you to put your hand up with the number that you think resulted in more earned medals. Okay, I see, it, see a lot of twos, I see some ones. The answer is number two. That's what the research showed, that those athletes that focus on mastering their sport and getting better, they won more in the end. So that's sometimes counterintuitive. You think if you want to win, you focus on winning. No, research shows that if you want to win, you focus on mastery approach. Now let's look at a coach who does this well. Okay, now I'm showing the other movie. So there we have it. We have the principle number one, Helm Tree of Mastery, and what I've just shown you are two examples. Of one is the scoreboard definition, which was that first coach, and the second one was the mastery definition coach. So scoreboard definition coach, focus on results, winning versus losing, pretty simple. Mastery definition focuses on effort. What does it take to get that win? Are you working the hardest you can that day? Scoreboard definition, it's all about comparison with others. Are you better than that person next to you? Are you better than the person across from you? Mastery definition, it's learning. How are you, what are you learning right now to be the best or to be better later? And finally, scoreboard definition is that mistakes are not okay, whereas mastery definition, mistakes are okay. How cool is that? Mistakes are okay under the mastery definition of learning. Why is that important? Well, we've all heard that mistakes are the lifeblood of learning. How can you learn to cradle with your left hand or cook, kick with your left foot? How can you do those things if you're not going to fail the first time? How can you learn a new play? How can you learn a new stroke? Well, mistakes are a part of learning. So if we know that in sports as coaches and as athletes, if we know we're going to fail, I'm sorry, not fail, make mistakes in practice, we know we're going to make mistakes in games, shouldn't the important focus be not that we're making the mistake but what we're doing afterwards? And that's exactly what the mastery definition coach focuses on. The mastery definition, we've come up with elm tree of mastery to help you remember those different components for mastery definition. E is for effort, L is for learning, N is for mistakes are okay. And this mastery climate, what do you think it does to anxiety? Do you think it goes up or do you think it goes down? Down, right? And with a mastery climate, anxiety goes down. Athletes are more in control, they're calmer. What happens to self-confidence? It goes up. As you're less anxious, you feel more confident. This is what 25 re years of sports psychology research has shown us. Now, when that player is feeling less anxious, they're feeling more, more confident, what does that give them a feeling of? Control. Okay? And athletes who have control they're able to work harder and stick to it longer. Let's talk about this in a real scenario. Jesse hangs his head every time he misses a shot, and as a result, he doesn't get back on defense. What can you do? Now, I would like you to turn to the person next to you and answer this question. What can you do in this scenario? So now people are talking for a few minutes. Oh, shoot, I meant to say... You're going to have two minutes to talk about this. <laughs> I'm going to raise my hand, and when you see my hand, that means it's time to focus forward again. We'll talk about it as a group. Go. Just pretend I said that the first time. Okay. <laughs> okay, so. Okay, thank you, everybody. Let's, let's share some of these thoughts. I'd really love to hear from you. 
So Kelly, can you share with us, what did you guys talk about when you thought, what can we do in this scenario? Um, we talked about how we would take him out of the game, not because he made the mistake, but because he's so preoccupied with it that he's not able to focus on the next plays that are coming up. So we think it was really important to take him out of the game, talk to him about it a little bit, get him to refocus before we send him back in. Okay. Anybody else have a different approach that they would have taken? Yes, Ruben. Well, you know, um, actually I don't have a different approach, but I would take a different approach if this was like the, the first time that it happened. I might call out something or wait till a, a time out and, and talk to Jesse about it. Um, but because it says it happens all the time, I like Kelly's approach. Um, this is a, a pattern, and so I think, you know, got to get him out of the game and uh, coach, him, coach him on it right away. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Um, you know, all of these are, are great approaches, and I love that you guys are sort of talking about it and thinking about it in terms of the elm tree, right? So was his effort there? Yeah, it was, right? He tried to make a shot. Can you help him learn from that? And I like that you're thinking about how can we help him learn from that. In, starting on page 21 in that very powerful book in front of you, you'll see an entire section on how to utilize the Elm Tree of Mastery and how to introduce this into your coaching philosophy. And I really encourage you to take the time after this workshop to read through that section. But I want to draw your attention right now to page 23, which is, which is the Mistake Ritual Toolkit. Uh, I want to draw attention to this because what's so important with making mistakes is not that you, whether you make them or not, we know athletes are going to make mistakes, it's how you recover. Because at PCA, we say that the, the most important play is the next play. So if an athlete is in a game and they're making a mistake, how can you best get them to focus on the next play? If Jesse's hanging his head and he's, you know, upset that he missed a shot, how is that helping him get back on defense and help his team? How is that helping him prepare for the next time he has the opportunity to shoot? I want to show you a brief video from um, a national advisory board member, Curtis Granderson. He is uh, a baseball player for the New York Mets, and he has shared with PCA his own personal mistake ritual. Do you guys, are you familiar with this video? No. It's in DevZone. If you look up Curtis Granderson, you'll see it's 40 seconds, and he basically talks about how his coach in college introduced a little toilet, and they did the flush, and I think it's the, one of the best explanations of the flush I've ever seen, so I love that video. Cool. Okay, so... What's really cool about what Curtis Granderson's coach did for him is he gave him not only a physical symbol, they flush their mistakes, but it was this sense of the coach recognizes it, the athlete recognizes it, and it's okay. Mistakes happen, it's okay, let's move on. Lots of ways you can do this with your team. I've seen brush it off, shake it off. I've seen um, the lac lots of lacrosse teams put their sticks up in the air as an acknowledgement, hey, if that mistake happens, but let's focus on the next thing. What I love about the mistake ritual and what's truly powerful about this tool is that it gives athletes this extreme sense of courage and control on the field. How many of you want a team full of athletes who are aggressive and assertive? How many of you want that on their team, right? We all do. Because those teams are going to get after it and they're going to be the first ones there. And so in order to have that, you have to let them feel the courage to maybe make a mistake one time, but the next time they're going to make a phenomenal play that they would not have had the courage to do otherwise. Now we're going to talk about whatever the next principle is. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Nice job. Yay. <laughs> you did that well. Six minutes to spare. That was great. Yeah. Sometimes I tried to make it 20 minutes, but with the... Uh, or 15 minutes, but with the um, without doing actual group work, it, you know, it's like hard to get that timing right. Yeah, no, that's fine. That's good. It's better to err on the side of brief, and then you can always add on at the end or make the scenarios longer. I mean, I don't think you miss anything. I, I felt like you covered a lot in that short amount of time. And as you said, getting you know answers from people and group work and things like that that'll definitely add to the time in there. Um, all right, Ruben, did you want to give Katie some feedback to start us off? Sure. Yeah, yeah, Katie, I think your ability to move at that pace is a real strength. Um, you know, uh, I think it, I think it's, 
I think it's a strength and it, it's going to give you flexibility and allow you to do a lot of stuff in workshops and it's going to allow you to engage your participants more. Um, you know, it's going to allow you to bring in an extra video, which we'll definitely share with the other trainers that we've got this awesome example of mistake ritual. Um, I, I think it's awesome, awesome strength. Um, so, so, so um, Katie, so many things. You're so proficient and and natural, and you, uh, I have confidence in you as a participant that you know what you're talking about. I mean, absolutely. Um, and, um, so, so I'm, I'm trying to think of a couple of yeah, a couple things. You know, when you talk about scoreboard definition and mastery definition, I don't know if I missed it. Um, I, I think it's it's good to make it very clear we're talking about a definition of winning and success. Uh, you, you know, so um, I, I would I would uh, make sure that you highlight that as you start comparing the two. That what we're talking about is a because you, you I was guys are wondering definition of what definition of what, okay. Um, and then, um, and then I think you will do this with uh, a, a live workshop group. Um, the 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 videos are an opportunity to get our reaction and get our voices into the room and get us talking right. And so um, I, I like the idea with the, with the videos. Not, not, maybe not every single video, but with many of the videos that you you ask us a follow up. So what do you think of that? Um, you know, or what's your reaction to that, or um, how are, how is this second coach similar to the first coach? But but taking taking advantage of that opportunity to pull 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 a, pull us in, uh, pull our voices in and get us interacting. Okay, yeah, that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. All right, Rachel, did you have a comment for some comments for uh, Katie? Yeah, I thought you did good, Katie. I I think for me, I think you did a good job of. Uh, also, eye contact, and I think the way you're standing, you look professional, but also um, controlled and casual. Because I know that you know uh, it could be kind of a hostile atmosphere going in with coaches, and so I think that you know, like everyone said, I, I love the confidence, and so I was drawn in, and I loved your introduction too. I thought you did a really well <laughs> job of that. Thanks. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I had I had a lot of the same things down um, right off the bat. I think your presence was great. Um, you're on the younger side, so I think that's some, sometimes hard to command attention. But you are very, you're very assertive, and you know your stuff. And I think just because of the position that you're in, you have more resources at your fingertips than any of us. So I think it's really cool that you get to see live examples all the time, day in, day out, of all this stuff working, and you can just see it. Like you're, you're believing it. You're not just teaching us something that you learned. And I think the hard part for you is going to be, gosh, what stories do I tell? Because I have so many. <laughs> How do I pick and choose? Mm -hmm. um, I thought, I thought just, just some of your phrases I thought were really good. Like, we're not into giving participation trophies. I mean, it's little things that you said that I, I call them, like, sticky points. That's going to stick with me because that's something like, well, thank God, you know, everybody else gives participation. We're not, PCA is not about that. I thought that was good. Um, we know that you, just the way you, you, you're, you changed your voice intensity, like, we know you love to win, and we're going to make sure you're not missing out. Like, right there, that makes me want to listen to what you're going to say. I thought that was great. Your personal story right at the beginning, fantastic. I think it's it was awesome just to hear. You know, I just love the way you said it. It was a time machine. How many of us would love to go back and send our old coaches through a PCA workshop because, you know, you definitely would have won more and you would have been better faster, but think about that would have done for you as an athlete too, you know. So I thought that was a really great a great story and way to do it. Um, I think this is such so tiny. You said better athletes, better coaches when you said the tagline, just a little – Instead of better athlete, yeah, it's okay. It's not a big deal, but I just I, I was like, oh, I gotta write that down just in case. Um, which it would be better athletes, better coaches too. I think that's good. Um, my only, you know, it's same thing that Ruben said. Just because you have so much information and you are a pretty fast talker and you're good at your pace, just make sure that you do leave time for reflection from the audience rather than just telling them. You did a lot of telling us great stuff, but make sure you ask. Like even something simple as, you know, and I even wrote the same thing Ruben said at the end of the Marshall video. Rather than telling us how winning focused he was, ask what we noticed as an audience. What, kind, what did you notice? What, what things did he do well? What things? Because a lot of times we use that as a negative example. Like this is a bad coach. He didn't do anything right. Where actually he did some things right. He said he was proud of them. He said they gave a good effort out there. So it's good to see that winning, a winning focused coach isn't necessarily all bad. Um, it's just the way he handled it was bad. So just, just noticing, comparing, maybe ask the audience, how, do you, how would you compare these two coaches? What do you see? And then after you get some answers from the audience, then you can confirm with your follow-up. Well, this is what PCA 
believes and all that kind of stuff. Okay. Um, and then, and then you did the you did the group work, which I thought was great. Thumbs up, thumbs down. You said very powerful book. I mean, just the way you said that, this is such a powerful book. Um, rather than so many trainers that are like, yeah, read this book. It's got a lot of really good stuff in it. Like I was convinced, like, wow, this is a power. That's a great way to say that book. And um, and I'm excited to see the Curtis Granderson video because I've never seen it. So thank you. I like it a lot. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Forty seconds, which is kind of a perfect clip size for. It is. Yeah. Now, can we can we get that as like an MP4? Is it already? I just, well, I have YouTube access, so I can download it, but I can send it. I just yeah. downloaded it today, so I can actually send it to you guys right now. That would be awesome, because yeah. I'd love to see that. Can you, do, you can do that with any video that's on DevZone, right? I can, yeah, in case okay. you can. <laughs> uh, we don't allow that to privilege to everybody, but um, <laughs> we can, anything you ever, if you ever see a video that you're like, I want to use this, just shoot mm -hmm. me an email and I'll get it to you. Okay. Okay, great. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. How did you feel now? How did you feel doing the double gold coach? I know it's obviously not a live audience, but how did you feel doing that today compared to doing the triple impact competitor last night? Um, what's interesting is I was so focused up until this morning on tick that uh, I spent the morning just trying to make sure I remember the differences, like in how these two workshops flow and the mm -hmm. different content. And you know, I was kind of bummed because when I the section I really love about Tick is the hazing bullying section. Mm -hmm. and I would have loved to show you guys, like to do that for you guys today, but this was good. It like got me out of my comfort zone because I, even though the it's the same, um, set, Elm is more or less the same. It's like how you how you um, cue it up for them is definitely different. Yeah, it's like teaching instead of teaching athletes like, hey, it's okay to make mistakes. You're like teaching coaches, like, back off. It's okay if they're making mistakes. Yeah, and the value of it, which I think you hit home pretty well. It's not this, we're telling you to be nicer. We're telling you because we want the best performance out of your athletes. So I think you did well with that. And the, the de developing competitors workshop, you know, would be perfect because that does go into the hazing and bullying. Yeah, I haven't looked at the um, deck for that, but I'm, I probably would be interested in doing that one too. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, you... I don't know how much you guys heard from Molly. Oh, I guess you saw the email, but there were like almost 150, 200 boys, and it was like not a, probably an ideal first workshop situation because they were pretty noisy through the first half hour of it. But um, so this is a nicer audience. <laughs> <laughs> so that being said, what would you have done differently with 200 freshmen? Like looking back at what you know kind of was tough, what would you have done differently going into it? Well, so having watched you do the tick workshop, I, I, I watched that video like three times. And, <laughs> and then, you know, obviously studying the PowerPoint and the slide notes and having seen, I've seen Ruben do it twice in person and Tina, there's, I think the emphasis is like, you know, keep them moving, get them interacting. And that was just the wrong approach with this size group mm -hmm. and this age. So what I would have, I think, I, I mean, I think Molly thought so too. Like I tried to adjust midway through and be like, I can't really throw it out to them because if I said, even like I use the better athletes, better people thing and I had a microphone and it was just anytime I said, okay, two minutes, go, it was like mayhem. Mm -hmm. And so I think what I would have done differently knowing the size of the group and the age of the boys, I would have probably spent more time sort of lecturing and less time giving it out to them mm -hmm. or more time with hold your finger up with the number you think you know or right. raise your hand if you like silent sort of interactions yeah um, but I am pretty excited to do a tick workshop with less people because mm -hmm. I want to do that interaction and that interactivity stuff but it just wasn't going to work with that size group yeah it's hard I it's brought candy what'd you say I said I would have brought candy yes that helps too. I, that can get out of control too, though. Believe it or not. I know. So I didn't bring it, but now I'm thinking because you know I wanted them to read the quotes and like 200 boys, and not a single person would volunteer. Like, <laughs> Come on! Like, <laughs> so, but it was good. I mean, it was a rush for sure. I was like, I got home that night. I was like, here we go. Let's do more workshops. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. Well, that, I mean, that's that's a tough one to start on and. The, the, I'm not going to go too far because I'm going to let Rachel go, but there is definitely a total, I think they're different workshops when you do it as an assembly style versus a small group room and you, you know, you're dead on. You have to definitely keep the group a little more in control and keep it more video focused and you focused yeah. than, you know, get up, move around and talk. And it'd be yeah. nice if it was that way, but yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you very much. 
All right, Rachel, we are psyched and ready. All right. Okay, so I'm gonna um, I'll be transitioning from the Jesse story into really emotional text, just to kind of give you an idea of where I'm. My thought process is on the slides once I finish my introduction. Okay. So that's uh, what I will be uh, focusing on with the principal. Okay. For me, uh, which I told Ruben in the mock, I I love that you, Katie, you you stood up and did all that. Now I'm like super jealous. But I I made like little visual notes. Of oh, there where you go. So that's kind of what. So if I look down, that's kind of my way of like okay, like my cue on slides until I get more comfortable. I mean, that's yeah. the biggest thing is just getting comfortable with knowing what the next slide is. So I can do this. We good? We're good. All right. So, okay, well, neither of you are, I'm going to role play a little bit. So I know there's no Brooke in here, but that's the, that's the gal's name that introduced me. So, all right. Well, thanks, Brooke, for that awesome introduction. Um, it's not every day that you get to have flashbacks of uh, moments in time where you really excelled as a coach and an athlete. And so I'm sure, you know, all of you out in the audience right now, um, have had many moments as coaches that you're successful and, and, and being an athlete and that's really what this is all about is um, the way in which um, you know we felt as an athlete the, the wins that we in terms of the coach that we feel as a coach and so you know for me I really I, I love PCA I actually didn't know about it about seven months ago I was introduced to PCA um, I've always had a passion to mentor coaches and mentor athletes because when PCA found me I actually had been out of coaching for about four years and so I'm excited to uh, share with you today um, some really awesome principles and and things that PCA stands by because I know most of us in here uh, don't want to lose we want to win we all agree if you, if, you, if you like losing you gotta get up and leave because I just don't know why you're even doing it. I'm just totally kidding stay uh, but mm -hmm. We want to win, and so we really believe, you know, in PCA as far as being a double goal coach, is that that's that's really important. But there is also another side um, to PCA in creating better athletes and ultimately creating better people. And I love that that we focus on that mastery side as well, because I'm going to be honest with you, I'm not an athlete anymore. Yeah, I work out, but the skills that I learn from some amazing coaches as well as some coaches that weren't that good is really what molded me into the person I am today. And so I wish, um, you know, I had some of these principles back when I was coaching. Uh, but I also found that there was a lot of stuff that I was doing right, pat in the back for me. Um, and even as an athlete, there are some instances where, you know, I didn't have some good experiences, but I had some really great experiences. So I'm not here to say that every experience I had was good, bad, and different. But I am here to say the good news is this. Nothing that I'm going to present today is my own opinion. Even though I think it's very valid, um, this is all backed by research. And so I'm really big on a couple of things. One, um, breath. I think breathing, inhaling, and exhaling is such a good positive thing. And I know that you guys have busy lives. You're probably spinning multiple plates from you know, your family, your friends, also obviously coaching and other things. And I don't know you know what's going on outside so when you guys came in today I just want everyone to just take a big deep inhale and then exhale out because here's the thing this is going to be painless it's actually going to be a lot of fun and I hope that you laugh a little bit and if you cry that's awesome too um, but more than anything just this is going to be you know I'm going to respect your time for the next 90 minutes we're just going to you know, like I, I love getting giving word descriptors. So if I were to give you something today, I would give you what I call a tool belt. So PCA could be something. I would say it's a tool belt. Now, if you have a tool belt, everyone has a different size that's going to fit around your body, right? But we would agree that a tool belt needs to be durable. Um, it needs to be uh, obviously stable. And so when you're looking at these things, this tool belt. The difference between maybe your tool belt and the coach sitting next to you is the tools that are on it. So real quick show of hands, I kind of get an idea. How many of us have been to a PCA workshop? Okay, maybe one of you. All right, one of you have, which is awesome. So maybe for your tools, we're just going to sharpen and refine them a little bit. Um, 
Or maybe some of you, you know, you're going to get rid of some tools. Or maybe some of you, we're, we're just going to add a couple. So the goal behind this is that um, I want to impact and empower you just to be better at what you already are doing. We all can agree that that tool belt is filled with one thing for sure. We have passion for our sport and passion for our athletes. So how can we take being a double goal coach and excel so that we can continue to win and create an atmosphere where our athletes are not just getting fundamentals and learning but becoming better people. And so I'm going to, uh, we're going to look at several principles but this is when I obviously transition. Um, so you guys just, you did a great job of looking at the uh, scenario with Jesse. You guys got to, I love, I love what you would do as far as some recommendations, but I want to kind of look at that a little bit deeper. Um, you know, and, and this, this picture that you see up here on the slide is, obviously we know what that is. It's showing a gas tank. Hopefully we, you know, we notice that that's two gas tanks. So quick show of hands, would you rather get in a car that has a, a, an E, meaning you have no gas in the car, or would you rather have a gas tank that has the F that's filled? So raise your hand if you'd rather have a gas tank that's filled with E. Okay, right. Nobody does, right? We, it's inoperable. Now, I want you to think about this. Think about it in terms of an athlete. Now, I can have, let's say, a Honda Civic, and the gas level's at E. And then I can have a Maserati, right, really cool high-performance car, and the gas tank's at E. Does it matter that the high performance to maybe the slower car, if both gas tanks are on E, it doesn't matter? Well, now let's reflect that to an athlete. You can have a very talented athlete and not a very talented athlete, but if both of their emotional states are low, they're not going to perform at the highest levels. So I love looking at this in terms of um, literally a fuel tank. How can we energize the athlete's gas tank that's low and then also too not to keep to keep in mind that the athlete that's coming in and has a high level um, in terms of emotional state how can we sustain that because that's important too we don't want to be uh, draining their tank so uh, the next slide shows you know some some when you're looking at athletes let's go through some examples of what maybe some athletes may look so, because here's the thing as a coach we have a game plan, we have a practice plan, but we're not tunnel vision. We have to really be aware and know our athletes. And some that may be, for example, hanging their head, that might be an example. Something's going on outside of practice. But if all we're focused on is get going from A to B to C, they're not going to be able to perform at the highest. So this principle of filling um, an athlete's emotional tank is super important. So I just want you to guys give me three examples of not what's, what an athlete would look like if their emotional tank is low, but three examples of what an athlete's emotional tank looks like when it's completely filled. Anyone can go ahead and share. Three examples. I think they look energized. Good, Ruben. Anybody else? They're happy to be there at practice. Right. And uh, Kelly, do you have anything to add to that? I just think aggressive. Like everything you do, they're just going to do it aggressively and, and quickly and efficiently. And most of the times, we love those athletes, right? They're, I mean, they're super coachable. It's like, holy smokes, I don't have to do anything. They're our game plan, we go from you know, the beginning to practice to end of practice. But that's not the case. We don't have a full team of uh, you know, athletes that come into practice that are, are filled up. Okay, uh, and so it's really our job, and it's a completely, uh, it's controllable, because here, here's the thing, when the athlete walks into practice, that is our, that is our incubator, that's our environment, that's where we create that culture that they can either fill up their tanks or decrease their tanks, their emotional state. So it's not about what happened to the athlete outside of practice or outside that game when they're walking in, it's about what's about to happen. And so being aware of your athletes is important and being able to make sure that we're, we're figuring out where they are emotionally because it's easy to deal with some of them. It's like, yeah, let's go ahead, let's do this. But what about that athlete or athletes that are, as you see, ha are filled with pessimism? They give up easily. Um, and as a result, they're, less, you know, they're being less coachable. 
A lot of coaches, I know for me being a college coach, and I, this is one example with PCA, I would ignore the athlete. They frustrated me that much that I'd ignore it. Did it help? No, because attitude is contagious. It affected the whole team. It affected me. Now, while I didn't maybe show it, it was always in the back of my mind. And that could be a byproduct of just a poor practice just because I didn't handle that situation. And so it's very important to understand that it is controllable, the culture that we create our team, to make sure that we're being um, emotional tank fillers and not drainers. And so looking at the next slide, um, I want to go through an example because I think it's so important, like, you know, I want to have some fun here today. And so when we're looking at filling the emotional tank, we'll go through the whole list here in a moment. But I brought an awesome beach ball, okay? So um, here's, here's what we're going to do. So you're all sitting in, in your seat right now. I want everyone to look underneath your seat. If you have a piece or a, a if you have taped to the bottom of your seat an entire package of gum, you're my guinea pigs. <laughs> All right. So Ruben and Katie, come on up. Okay, you guys. Now, for sake of the thing, you guys get. I know you don't. You don't want to be put on the spot. I get it. But we're gonna have some fun. You guys got gum out of the deal, so there you go. And if you want to share it to your counterpart, lovely friend coaches next to you, you can. But what I want to show is an example. Of, of how powerful filling one's tank up can be, or that for back, a lack of a better you know, way of saying it, how it can also be detrimental. And so I'm not going to spend the whole time, so I'm going to kind of go real quick. So basically, um, it's similar to what you did, Kelly, as far as the example. Katie, you'll be the shooter. Ruben, you'll be the hoop. Audience, um, I'll explain all this. I'm just going to go through it quickly. Audience, I want you to cheer because she's going to make it. Now, uh, Katie, you made the shot. Your friends in the stands, right, were cheering. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How do you feel when you made the shot, right, and everyone was rooting for you? What are some feelings that you may have had in that moment? I felt pretty excited. Felt pretty excited. <laughs> right. You probably felt like the hoop was like this big, right, huge, right? It's going to make you want to shoot again. Um, uh, I know for me, being an athlete, uh, when I when I shot and made a basket, I thought I was unstoppable. Now, that's not the case. I could miss the next one. But it, it gave me the confidence with that positive affirmation, that tank filling, that hearing of the cheering, the coach going like this, all of those verbals and nonverbals really made me want to shoot again, really put a little pep in my step. Okay, next scenario, Katie, you're going to shoot it. Ruben, you're going to move your arm so she misses it. And then coaches in the audience, I want you guys just to just lay into her. Boo, whatever you want. Just don't throw anything at her. We're not going that far as rowdy fans. Um, all right, in that scenario, Katie, would you say you missed the shot, you're getting some really, some some literally tank draining um, nonverbals and verbals. How do you feel now? I feel pretty uh, good. <laughs> Right, so it's probably, probably not going to want to shoot it again. I know, and it reminded me way back, and I don't know how familiar you guys are with Gonzaga, but they have some really rowdy fans. And I remember the court being very close um, to where we played, and I would, before the game even start, psych myself out because they're just that bad. Make or miss, we, we heard it. And I... Honestly, I wish there was at those moments, um, you know, my coach having just a couple of nonverbals and maybe even better preparation of creating, again, that culture where we knew going into that that we could be equipped and kind of like armored for those moments. And so, obviously, if you're getting that sort of negative feedback, you're probably going to be hesitant on the next shot, which is what we don't want as coaches. We want you to be loose. We want you to be confident. All right, last scenario, Katie, you're going to shoot. You're going to miss it. And I want the, the crowd to give you positive reinforcement. So how would you say you would feel in that instance? You missed it, but you got some good kudos. I'm bummed I missed it, but I feel like it was, it was worth it taking a shot, and I'll shoot again. Right. So that's, and that's the goal as a coach. We don't, because here's the thing, you guys, is we want to win, right? We absolutely want to win. So if we want to win and we know that research is showing that if we can positively uh, influence our athletes and fill their tanks up. That doesn't mean we're not providing uh, criticism. 
or constructive criticism. That's not what we're still, we're creating teachable moments. We're not creating a moment that's completely negative that puts them in a point where they just don't want to perform at all. But in that instance, if Katie misses it, you know, a quick thing that I would do as a coach is being that the game, and this, we have got a variety of sports out here, so I know we're using basketball, but it's a quick paced sport. I don't have a whole lot of time to correct her form and tell them what it's saying, but what I can control is that I'm not going to do this, a nonverbal, okay? I'm not going to be like, I can't believe it, a verbal. What I am going to do, it's okay, you'll get the next one. And even her not audibly hearing me, she knows it's positive coming out of my voice. And then maybe when, I, when she comes out, I can then provide that constructive person, hey, you know, we, we, you missed it. Yes, we're, we're disappointed in that. But honestly, next time, get your feet set. We want you to keep shooting because we believe in you. And so what I'm ultimately trying to voice here with you guys is that I understand it's not going to be, you know, sunshine and lollipops every time. Your athletes are going to miss. But we have control of our body and what comes out of our mouth. And it can be detrimental if it's purely negative, which in this last slide that you see here in this principle, as far as the e-tank toolkit, which I love, absolutely love the power of double goal coaching. This book, honestly, I've read it probably a hundred times and still find things that are useful. So in here, before we turn, though, I want to kind of get an idea of what you guys think as far as a good ratio between positives and criticism. So how many either one to one, so just a, a number one show of hand, three to one or five to one? that you think that should be positive to criticism. So how many of us one to one? Okay, how many of us three? How many of us five? Okay. <laughs> We've got a mixed bag here. All right. Here's what research shows. Five to one is um, our goal. Now is it necessarily possible every time? Well no. Turn to here's a great example. Turn to page thirty two in your in your uh, on your in your book. And you'll find, um, again, this is all about basketball today, you guys. Phil Jackson, our national spokesman, um, amazing coach. Most people know him. But here's a great story about how he even being that successful with Horace Grant was one to three. And it was his goal to bring that ratio up where at least he was in the positive. So what I'm saying is that it may not be great, great, awesome, and you're good and you suck. It might not be like that, but what we can do is create at least where it's not, um, you know, less positives to criticisms. And I kind of mentioned this before nonverbals count, they do count towards um, creating uh, more positives and examples of uh, filling your athlete's emotional tank. And so, this is this is just goes to show you that you know if the pros can do it, which is very entertainment based, we as high school coaches can definitely do it. The other thing that I want to end with in this principle, which I think is so huge, and this again is just relating to you know me as a coach, I love the toolkit. I honestly would, if I were to coach tomorrow, I'd be using this. And there's actually a really great PCA trainer that brought up this example. Um, and it's the positive charting. So if you guys don't know some examples and ways that you can create that culture and atmosphere where we're um, uh, creating that portable home team, um, this is a good chapter to refer to. And so what the positive charting is showing is that um, it takes the focus off the scoreboard, puts the focus on effort. And so I love what this trainer did with her, her team is basically gave three by five cards. Um, to the athletes in the very beginning, it could be done uh, before the game. You could prep your your um, your parents that will be involved at maybe a parent meeting. Uh, but it's simple. They're going to get a three by five card. Maybe three points might be they're going to chart boxing out, taking a charge, and what I call tips. Tips would be any time that on defense they get their hand on the ball. So all effort based. The parents are going to tally those up. We'll collect them at the end. And then I love giving rewards. Obviously, you guys have seen that with the with the gum. So maybe it might be a Gatorade, or maybe it might be that that athlete the next practice gets to decide 
uh, what drill they want to do. But they will get rewarded, and the parents, which are huge factors as well, get to um, be involved and, again, take the focus off the scoreboard, focus on their kids' efforts, and then you create that atmosphere where they're, now they're cheering for their athlete because they know they want their daughter to win that effort, uh, you know, the positive charting effort sheet that you've got there. And it just creates this, again, incubator where we're, we're shifting that, we're shifting the atmosphere of sport in that game and in that practice and relaying it back to why we're here today to become better double goal coaches where we can do these things that allow us to win more. But at the end of the day, these athletes leaving so that when they get to talk about you 10, 15 years from now, like I get to talk about my coaches, they're saying nothing but positive things. And I'm done. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Did I mute you? All right. No, I yeah. muted myself. Oh, you're good. Okay. That, that was great. That was perfect timing. 30 seconds to go. Well done. Thank you. You guys both are very strong. You know your stuff, which is awesome, which is very impressive. Ruby, would you like to start, or would you like me to jump in? Why, why don't you start this time, Kelly? Okay. All right. I just uh, I was impressed right away. I loved the examples that you used in your intro. There's your timer. Hold on. Ah. Um, I just love the examples that you used. I loved your language. Um, I, I saw that in Katie too. You guys just you can tell that you have a great handle on what you're talking about, and right away that gives you credibility. You're not fumbling for words. You're not you know um um you know not sure what's. I mean you guys you know it and you're passionate about it. And I love the fact that this is new to you, Rachel. That you know you said just seven months ago is when I heard about this, and I thought it was very cool the way that you reflected back and said. You know, I, I found out after hearing about PCA recently that there were things I would have done differently, but there's also things I was doing right. You know, I thought that was, that's okay to give yourself credit for that. So I thought that was really nice. Um, I love the way you said, you know, nothing in this is really my opinion. It's backed up by research. You put that in there, but it wasn't like we are a research-based program that da-da-da-da-da. It's just the way you phrase it. I thought it was very smooth. I liked that. Love the tool belt example. That was a visual. I got it. I understand that people have different sizes of tools. Um, I also like the way that you made it valuable for the people that have already been to a PCA workshop because sometimes they're like, oh, I had to come. It's mandatory for a lot of coaches, and they have to come back again, but there's a great idea. Maybe there's some tools that don't work. Or The only thing I would have gone one step further maybe is said, you know, and I would love to hear at the end the people that have been to a workshop before, what tools have worked for you or what tools would you change. Just, just another way to make it a little bit interactive. Yeah. Um, I love the, the Maserati and Civic example. I have a story that I use in a lot of my workshops about my husband running a beautiful Corvette convertible when we were in the Virgin Islands and my mom running a minivan and we ended up having to drive her minivan around the island because his ran out of gas. Same kind of a story that, you know, I love it. I thought it was great. Again, very good visual. Um, the gum tape to your seat is cool. I think that's a fun way to get people to volunteer. The one thing that I've done before, if I've done something like that, to force somebody to volunteer, say, okay, you have a choice. You can come up and volunteer for me or you can hand your gum to somebody else. Because it might be somebody that just doesn't feel comfortable and you yeah. want to give them an out. So not that they want to give their gum away, but that's just a little comment that I put in there. Um, and the only other comment that I have is, um, I, you know, the example, the shooting, you know, I know I've, I've explained that, how I do that too. One of the other ways that I've done it, which has worked out well too, and I do it a lot more with the athlete workshops, but um, I make it competitive because, I mean, bottom line, you're in a room of competitive people. So what I'll do is have one side of the room be the tank drainers and the other side of the room be the tank fillers. And it's really cool to point out how easy it is for people to drain tanks and how the volume of drainers is higher. And then you have the people, okay, now, she, I have them miss the shot twice. Like, I don't do the successful shot. I'll have, okay, Katie missed the shot the first time, or, you know, you're going to drain her tank, this side of the room. And they're, ah, you know, they're really loud and they're negative. And I say, oh, Katie, you're going to miss this again, but now this side of the room is going to fill her tank. And it's so obvious because there's like a pause. And everyone's like, uh, good job. Like, they don't really know what to do because it's not natural. So it's a great way to say, did you notice the difference? Which one was easier? Which one was louder? Which one had more energy? That's what we're up against in society. You know, so just, just a different, a different yeah. option. Works really well with the high school kids. They get into that. And then the next step is... Can you make your filling as loud as they're draining? Like, let's hear it. Can you bust, can you really pump it up now? Mm -hmm. um, the only other comment that I have, I would love to see you get more out of the audience. Um, again, you know your stuff. 
You're very comfortable talking. It's just great to get more out of us. Five to one ratio is so right and so true. Well, let's find out from you coaches in the room, how do you bring up this ratio? What are things you do already? It also brings value to what the coaches have to say in their experience when you draw from them for examples and have you had a kid that had a low tank? Think about that kid. What did you do as a coach to you know pump that kid up even before you talk about e-tanks really? You know, they do things that are so great already. So that's that's just my big I would just love to see you pull more out of the audience, do a little bit more interaction and that type of thing. But I thought I thought you did a nice job. It was very, very smooth and I wanted to hear more. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Ruben or Katie? Um, I'll, I'll provide some feedback. Mm -hmm. um, I also, like Kelly, I really love the, um, there are things that I do right and things that I do wrong, and I like that you basically said the coaches, like, the same case for you. It's like giving credit where credit is due, and I really liked that. Um, I also liked that you said, this isn't my opinion, when you talked about, like, what you're going to share today, because... I think that people get, you know, that's just an, it's almost like a nice reassurance. Not that you're not trustworthy, but like, they don't know who you are. And so yeah. it's nice, like, this isn't, I'm not making this up. Um, mm -hmm. And I also really love the Gonzaga example, because that was something that like, I can picture that happening. And not only that, I can picture that happening on the TV, which like, mm -hmm. just that name is big enough where, and I think that adds so much credibility. Mm -hmm. um, to you and to your experiences, so I love that you did that. My only feedback, or I would say, I would say, like was that there were so many basketball references that if mm -hmm. you know you're going to be working with an audience where there's no basketball players, so like you know you're going to be working with only lacrosse coaches or whatever, or fo or football coaches, you know, knowing that like ba basketball references are okay, but like I didn't play basketball and that was fine, but like maybe making sure that like you pull in other um, examples as well. Well, that's good. Thank you, Kitty. That's yeah. Good. That was awesome, though. It was fun to watch. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, Rachel. Um, my, my wish is um, that you, you sprinkle in more interaction as uh, uh, I think both Katie and Kelly said, you know, pull, pull us in uh, steadily and throughout. Um, so many positives. Um, good, strong opening. Um, gosh, you just you just bring a lot of energy as a trainer. Um, <clears throat> you smile as you as you facilitate. I heard you laugh. Um, you have animated body language, even when you're sitting down. You're you're, you're animated, you know. And um, you, you can tell you're enjoying it. You want to be here working with us. Um, so I thought I thought it was I thought it was very well done. Mm -hmm. Just one thing on that. I do have something else. I loved that you had them take a breath. And, and I think that's great, not only because people are wound up at the end of the day. And when you have coaches coming in at 6 o'clock or 7 o'clock at night, they're still thinking about, Ugh. and And the idea of breathing is also one of our tools. We do the three Bs, the breathe, bounce, break. I think you can even make it one step further. Everybody stand up. Okay, everybody's going to breathe. Then I want you to bounce and get all the stresses of your day out. You know, and then when we clap on three, we're going to break. And now we're ready to go for our workshop. So I actually, I, I've never done that, but I think I like that idea of having them just get rid of the day's junk and just focus. I thought that was really good. Um, the other thing, and I'm actually going to compliment Katie at the same time, the way that she said um, Positive Coaching Alliance, PCA, as I'm going to call it from here on out. And I think that's just a quick little line to put in there that's really important because a lot of these tools, you know, Elm Tree, PCA, Roots, blah, blah, blah. It's just alphabet soup, and it gets people really confused. So I think just saying, you know, are you good if I just call it PCA? And people are like, oh, I'm good. I got it. <laughs> so just, just something minor, but it does make a big difference. I agree. No, I'm, uh, I'm very excited. I think the Bay Area is uh, super lucky to have you guys. How did Molly put it? In your arsenal. Bay Area is good to have you, you guys in the arsenal. So... Um, and Rachel, Rachel's now in Southern California. She oh, that's started right. She is. That's, right. Down in that's right. Well, that's even better. Yeah. Cool. What's the next step, Kelly and Ruben? Yeah. Well, well, okay. Here's here's the next step. So, so, um, Katie, because you, we had you go out and do a tick workshop, um, you're in a different situation than most folks who complete Kelly's course. Um, you know, we're going to be able to, uh, based on Molly's feedback from your workshop last night, you're, you're, you're certified in your first workshop, which is TIC. 
okay, triple impact competitor. Um, now that you've completed the, the training uh, for Double Goal Coach One um, and you know the format, you know the content, we're also able to certify you in that workshop. So you'll have two workshops that you yeah, so congratulations. <laughs> and so, so, so you'll have two workshops that you're certified in and you can start applying for workshops right away. And we want you out there doing workshops <laughs> and then we'll look at adding adding the next certification, which probably it makes sense developing triple impact competitors because it's a combination of those two. So so Rachel's in the more standard situation when someone finishes Kelly's course, which is she's done all the training and she's done everything she's supposed to do by now and and she hasn't been out in front of a, a, a live group. So uh, the next step for, for, for Rachel is going to be to have her do what you did a couple times already, Katie, which is go out with a um, certified trainer and co-facilitate a workshop. And whether 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 Rachel, whether you do that once, twice, just depends on you know how how you and we feel um, you 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 you've progressed and, and how how ready you are. Um, but you're in a you're in a great place, Rachel, to to do that. And um, so so that's uh, those are the next steps. So then the next step, Rachel, for you would be to, we're going to send you some workshops that are in your area coming up, and you see which ones would work for your schedule. And if it works for you, then we'll just check with the partner and check with the trainer to make sure it's okay with them to get you out with them. And then we'll sign you up. And then you would, you would coordinate with that trainer, that certified trainer, and talk about which section you want to present. Um, and then we get feedback from that person on you. And, you know, if all goes well, our hope is that you're certified and doing them solo sooner than later. So... So when, um, I mean, I don't know if you guys know this, but I know it's the, it's the L.A. chapter. Uh, I mean, is, what are the odds of it getting coming more south? Do we have anything in the making with the Orange County area? Not that it matters. It's not far, but I know there's... I, I, a I can address that. I can address that. Um, you know, yeah, for the time being, the L.A. chapter is all of Southern California. And even before we launched the LA chapter, Rachel, we were doing workshops in Los Angeles. We were doing workshops in Orange County. We were doing workshops in San Diego. We were doing them out towards San Bernardino, uh, Santa Barbara. Um, okay. As far as the Santa Barbara. So, so it, it is true that the chapter is PCA, PCA Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. at, at the same time, I think sometime in the future, we will have PCA Orange County and I think we'll have PCA San Diego sometime in the future. It just, it just depends on um, how those communities uh, step up in terms of providing the, the seed funding to launch, uh, th launch those chapters. Um, but we, we, it, we have a head start in all those areas because we've been doing workshops throughout Southern California for almost 20 years now, not just Los Angeles. Okay. I was I just didn't know what that meant exactly. Okay. And and Rachel, once you're certified, you can apply to be the trainer for workshops anywhere. Okay. Um, you know, if you if if you if you, if you saw yeah, for sure throughout all of Southern California, we hope you'll consider all of those. Um, but even like let's say you see a workshop up in the Bay Area and you go, you know, I'm free that weekend and um, I wouldn't mind visiting friends and you, you know you can apply and. Um, and and um, yeah, you can apply. So uh, awesome. I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Yeah. And the next, just the, the next step too, just to let you know, Rachel, um, what we do is if, once you're certified in Double Gold Coach One, if you, because we have a, an EMS, it's called the another alphabet, um, so that you can look and apply for workshops. And if you see that in your area there's more athlete workshops than coaching workshops, and you're interested in doing that then you would just let Ruben know and say, hey, you know what, I'd love to do some of these athlete workshops. How do I get certified? And as kind of what you saw with Katie, like once you're certified as a trainer in one workshop, it's, it's much more simple to certify you in another one. A lot of it is a matter of you looking at the material, reading through it, and then having a, a call or a hangout with Ruben or myself or Eric to say, you know, to go through it again just to make sure that you're feeling confident about it and then you're certified and ready to do that. So cool. that's just the process from here on out. If you see certain workshops and you're like, yeah, I want to do it, but I'm not certified. How do I get certified in that? That's how it works. Okay. All right. Do you guys have any other questions for us? I have one more question. Yeah. So 
we're assume, we're assuming like as a whole the workshop, and I, I might be having just because I burn up early, I'm losing brain cells, but we're assuming that they have not read the double goal coaching book, going into every workshop. Pretty we're much. That a, okay. Yeah. We're making an assumption. Yes. But, okay. All right. Just wanted to make sure. It's an, it's an assumption. It's an assumption, but it's based on some good. It, it's a good assumption because, um, in most cases, the, the books aren't passed out to them until they arrive at the workshop. Okay. Um, and for 20 years, even even if the books have arrived early, very rarely do we see that people have have read them before. I know so. I would, but <laughs> yeah, you might get you know, a group of people that there might be like five or six people that have been to a PCA workshop before that are familiar with it, but you know, it depends on, on where you are. But no, for the most part, they it's all, it's brand new. Okay, cool. That's all I have. Thank you guys so much for your time. All right, you're welcome. We're always here if you guys need anything. Feel free to give us a buzz. Woohoo! <laughs> Congrats to both of you. See ya. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.